forward to going to the doctor and getting a shot. <laughs> you look forward to it. How many of you have had a doctor already tell you you need to get a flu shot? How many of you have already gotten a flu shot? All right, not many. We all walk by faith here. Um, but, you know, we go to the doctor, and sometimes uh, he will talk us into getting a flu shot or whatever, an inoculation, so that what we're getting a shot for keeps us from contracting something far worse. Amen? I'm a doctor today. I'm going to give us a shot. And I want to talk to you about the danger of offenses. Now, uh, I'm just calling this Satan's favorite weapon. How many of you have ever been offended? Now, the rest of you, you've already offended me because you just lied in church. <laughs> Let me ask again, how many of you have been offended? Somebody's hurt your feelings, you got mad, and you wished you had the power to call down fire, <laughs> right? Well, I want to talk to you about Satan's favorite weapon against the church because, you know, here we're praying for revival. And I've learned as a pastor, uh, and I've done this a long time, that it's very wise for me to teach on this at least once a year. And I want to be very clear, there's not a bunch of offenses running through the church, and I'm up here to stomp out fires. That's not it. This is preemptive. It's, it's an inoculation so that we don't get taken down by offenses <clears throat> because we want to see the Spirit of God move. Amen? So, amen. Amen. So it may sting a little bit today, but believe me, it's far better than actually being taken down the, the negative dark road of an offense and it running a number on you. Now, something else different today. I'm going to sit like this. Now, you say, well, was something wrong? No. I want to be real clear. Don't go out of here and say, well, he's really getting old because he had to sit down. That's not it. I rode 40 miles this week on my bike pedaling. I'm quite capable of standing for three services and walking around and doing what I do, but I just want to be more relaxed today. So, so just kind of change things up. So can I? Okay. All right. I, I'm, I'm floating like a butterfly, stinging like a bee. All right. So let's read Jesus' words, Matthew 18, 7. Now listen to what Jesus said, how seriously he took offenses. Woe to the world because of offenses. He says offenses must come. But woe to that man or woman by whom the offense comes. Now, when Jesus woes anything, you need to avoid it. Amen? So Jesus is woeing offenses here. So let's pray, and then I'm going to talk to you about this. Father, we just thank you for the word of God, the way it cleanses and the way it, it protects us, and, and the way, Lord, it covers us, surrounds us with your love, and keeps us healthy. Now, Lord, I pray that as I share on offenses, as we just see what your word says about it, I pray that, Lord, you will, uh, as, as we go into the word, that you will insulate this church, deliver this church, protect this church from being uh, taken down by Satan's favorite weapon so that we are not in any way grieving God, but we are wide open for revival for the moving of the Spirit, we are excellent targets for a move of God. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, offense free. I feel so strange sitting. Now, this is the way I do it on Wednesday nights, but I'm always down there. But here, see, I can swivel. I can, I can do this, so I can hit everybody. See, I kind of like that. All right. When I was a boy, I was a critter, critter guy. I love critters. My mother used to dread opening up my lunchbox when I got home from school because I crossed a creek when I was coming back from elementary school, especially sixth grade, fifth grade, and I always caught things, snakes, lizards, frogs, you name it. I caught them and brought them home, and I will never forget one day I caught a snake, innocent snake, but to a woman, it doesn't matter. It's a snake. And my mother was this way. And I put it in the lunchbox. I think it was a little green snake, garter snake. But I forgot to tell her it was in the lunchbox. And I remember being in my bedroom and hearing a scream come from the kitchen. And I heard my lunchbox hit the floor. And then I remembered, oh, no, the snake. Well, I heard about that for quite some time. When I was a boy, 
I learned the poisonous ones because there's four poisonous ones in Texas and the rest of them are innocent and they do you a favor. But there's four bad boys, copperhead, water moccasin, rattlesnake, those are your pit vipers, and then the coral snake. Now, the one that gets the biggest is the rattlesnake, but the worst one is the coral snake. Because the pit vipers affect your ability to breathe, they constrict your lungs. But the coral snake is of the cobra family. And the coral snake will, will melt your, your insides. Isn't that a beautiful thing? The coral snake will melt your insides, will turn your nervous system into jelly. Of all the four bad boys, the coral snake is the worst. And I learned what they looked like so that when I ran across one, I avoided it so that uh, the innocent ones I would save and, and, you know, leave alone. But the bad boys, I learned to leave them alone. Listen, folks, spiritually, we all need to learn the bad boys. Right? The, 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 what the devil uses to attack us the most. And the coral snake of Christianity is offenses. The coral snake. The worst, uh, the, the, the devil's favorite weapon is offenses. His coral snake is offenses. And we need to learn about that. We need to be aware of it. We need to watch out for it. We need to know that if, if an offense gets us, we are really going to be poisoned. Now, I'm going to tell you what I mean by an offense in a moment. But I want to talk to you today about Satan's coral snake, offenses, so that we'll recognize it and not be bitten and not be poisoned. Amen? Can I have an amen here today? Um, nothing is more lethal for individual Christians, marriages, businesses, or churches than the coral snake of offense. That's why Jesus said, woe to the world because of offenses. Woe to the world because of offenses. Offenses are the number one reason for divorce, broken friendships, and split churches. It's offenses. Now, in our text, Jesus speaks a woe over offenses, both over those who cause them and those afflicted by them. Now, the Greek word that we translate into the English word offense is scandalon. And the way I like to say it is, when you're offended with a scandalon, there is a scandal going on inside of you. Scandalon. Um, scandalon refers to the trigger of a trap that ensnares an unsuspecting victim. We've all done mouse traps, rat traps. I thought about bringing a rat trap, but I, I, I like my fingers being whole, and I was going to actually hold one up and snap it, but I thought the devil will see to it that I get trapped somehow, and I'll lose the crowd. So just think of a rat trap or a mouse trap, and, and you set that thing, and you put cheese on that trigger, and when the mouse comes up and decides to bite into that cheese, he doesn't know it's a trigger, and immediately, bang, the trap comes down upon him, and that mouse is no more. All right? So an offense, watch this now, is the trigger. The trigger of the trap of what follows an offense. Anger, hurt, unforgiveness, vengeance, all the various negative emotions we experience when offended the, the, the offense brings those negative emotions down upon us. Bang. We bite the offense. Somebody says something. Somebody does something. And, 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 and we, we bite into it. That is, we respond in an offended fashion. We're offended by what they did. And bang, here comes the trap. Now I'm feeling angry. Now I'm feeling hurt. Now I'm feeling rejected. Now I'm feeling... Um, Vengeance, I, I want to take vengeance, I want to hurt this person, I want to retaliate somehow. Now, just getting down into what the word really means, what Jesus really meant, there are several ways that we can offend or be offended. We can offend someone, get this, by enticing them to sin. We, that's an offense. This is actually the primary meaning of our text where Jesus is saying, woe to the world because of offenses. He's talking there about woe to the world because of those who entice others into sin by causing them to stumble and, and sin against God 
woe to those that cause those kinds of offenses. Now, we usually think of getting your feelings hurt, but the word can actually also mean enticing someone to do something wrong. The world has a horrible judgment coming. You know, I think of the porn industry and how many people are offended, caused a sin, enticed into that by these pornographers. And I think, what a judgment they have because Jesus said, woe to those who bring offense. In another place, he said, it's better for them that a millstone be tied around their neck and they be cast into the sea than they cause one of these little ones to be enticed, to stumble, to be enticed into sin. Okay? So it's very, very important that we never offend somebody that way. And we can also offend others by hurting them in a way that triggers, we might not even know we did it. We might not even know we did it. I've had people leave the church because I didn't say hi to them in the hall. I'm serious. And I had no idea I even saw them in the hall. If you know me, after I preach, you're better off talking to a tree. Because after I preach, I'm in the zone. I'm thinking about how it went, what I said, what I wished I'd said, how terrible I did. And, and I'm, I'm going through all of that, and picking myself apart. You come try to talk to me then, like I said, talk to a tree. You'll get a better response. So they left because I didn't say hi to them. I didn't even know I did it. Now, of course, that was very immature of them, but nevertheless, it happened. So, but we hurt people, intentionally or, or unintentionally, and, and the trap comes down. That flood of negative emotions sweeps over them. The offense becomes a stumbling block that prevents the offended person from moving forward in their walk with God because now they're dealing with the pain. They're dealing with what happened, and they can't shake it. We, we've all experienced it. Somebody says or does something that hurts or angers us. We can't believe they said it. We can't believe they did it. We're immediately flooded with emotions of anger and hurt, and the painful event, remember now, you've all experienced this, it's put on a continual replay loop in our mind. The, re, the reset button, the replay button, keeps getting hit, and I'll tell you who's hitting it, the devil's hitting it, because he wants you to replay it, replay it, replay it, replay it. He wants you to nurse it, he wants you to rehearse it. And... So that's what happens, and, and so we, we do, we nurse it. We start thinking, I can't believe they did that. I thought they were my friends. I thought they were this. I thought they were that, and we rehearse it, and here's what happens, everybody. Now, now, watch carefully. When we nurse it and we rehearse it, we will eventually disperse it by bringing others into our offense because offended people don't like to stay offended alone. They want other people siding with them. Amen? They want other people on their side. Let me tell you what they did. Of course, when you hear only one side, you've heard only one side. And the Bible says if you listen to only one side, you're a fool because there's always another side. Try marriage counseling for a week and see if that's not true. You can bring in one of the spouses and they will make the other one look like a devil until you get the other one in and they'll make that other one look like a devil. But if you don't get the other one in, you only get one side. And the Bible says don't ever do that because there's always two sides. Everybody say with me, there's always two sides. Always, always, always. So here's what happens. If we don't practice forgiveness, the offense can put down roots and it becomes a root of bitterness and then we're really in trouble because the Bible says a root of bitterness springs up like, like, a, like a bitter fountain and it defiles many because it touches many. Because if you don't forgive, you will never keep it to yourself. Once you nurse it and rehearse it, you will disperse it. Unresolved offenses cause spiritual joy to evaporate, desire for the things of God to dissipate, spiritual growth to stagnate. If it's not settled, the victim of the offense can literally be under its control for life. I have known people who were out of church for 25 and 30 years because of an offense that happened way back there. And their whole spiritual life has been choked out and controlled and dominated by one stupid offense. Can I say to you, nobody is worth our walk with God. Nobody. Amen, nobody. Now we Christians are very aware of the big bad sins on God's top 10 hit list 
adultery, stealing, murder, and so forth, where we're somehow blind to the coral snake of offense. We, we think we can cart around an offense and it not affect us, or it's not somehow uh, a, a sin in God's eyes, like, like the top 10 hit list, the Ten Commandments. Jesus knew better than anybody the danger of an unresolved offense, and he taught us to stop it in its tracks. Let me ask you, if you were watching TV and you looked down, and there in the middle of your living room was a coiled up rattlesnake, would you say, oh my, how did he get in? Honey, turn it up, I can't hear it well. Would you? No, everything would become about what? Getting that snake out. We ought to treat offenses the same way. Amen? I knew this wasn't going to be a jump up and shout message, and I'm aware of that because I'm the doctor and I'm giving a shot. You know, so it's going to sting a little bit. But here's the deal. Jesus taught us to be immediately proactive by going to the source of the offense first. Can I say that again? Jesus said, before you get bit by the coral snake, you better be immediately proactive by going to the source of the offense first. Jesus said, if another believer sins against you or offends you, Go privately, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, if they listen and confess it, you have won that person back. Now notice Jesus said, don't go tell the whole church. He said, don't go tell people that that are not a part of the problem or a part of the solution. He said, go to the person, go to the person. Go to them, because it's between you and them. It's not somebody else's business. Don't nurse it, don't rehearse it, and don't disperse it. The only time you need to let out is go to them. Go to the person who's part of the problem or part of the solution, not others who are innocent, who are gonna be brought into the offense. Jesus also taught us to be prolific forgivers. Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive somebody who sins against me? Seven times? No. Jesus said, not seven times, but 70 times seven. That's 490 times. You gotta be kidding me. But he's not kidding. He's making a point. He's using exaggeration to make a point. His point is we should forgive as often as we're genuinely asked to forgive. Forgiveness does not mean we gotta be reconciled to the offender but it does mean that we have released them and we've released ourselves by forgiveness just like God has forgiven us. See, see, I don't forgive for the other person. I forgive for me because I got to stay free. I can't stand up here and minister the word of God to you if I'm caught up in offense and bitterness. No, I've gotta be free. So I will forgive to keep my own spiritual life healthy and free. Amen? So either way, Jesus taught us to quickly handle an offense in marriage, at home, at work, with a neighbor, with friends, in church. Quickly forgive. They don't even have to be there. You can forgive without them even being there. You can forgive them in the presence of God. If you can't get to them, you can still forgive them in the presence of God. You can even forgive dead people. Oh, yes, because you never had a chance to go to them when they were alive. In the presence of God, you can say, Lord, I forgive them for what they did to me, for the offense that they caused me. I forgive them. And see, when we forgive, we are the ones who are set free. Jesus knew you've got to stay free. You'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. You've got to forgive. I want to read you a story about how an offense affected two people, and by extension, an entire church. And um, I pulled this from a very popular Christian periodical. It's a little bit lengthy, but I guarantee you, I will not lose you because it's very powerful. And I am reading it word for word as it was written. In 1981, Roger Faulkner had been a member of a church in a Chicago suburb for nearly two years. He had served as a Sunday school teacher for more than a year when the position of superintendent became available. Roger was excited about Sunday school and felt that he would be an ideal successor to the position. He went to the pastor and shared his vision and desire to serve, but to his disappointment, the pastor and the church board later chose somebody else to serve in that post. 
Roger was, ready, very offended that he wasn't considered for the job. But he didn't say anything to the pastor about it, first mistake. As the weeks wore on, Roger became increasingly negative and critical toward the church and the people. He began to find fault with the new superintendent and the Sunday school program. He began attending services less and less. I've noticed offended people will go from the back row to the middle row to the back row to no row. Now, enter Jeff Billings, another Sunday school teacher, who began to notice something wrong with Roger. And after church one Sunday, Jeff invited Roger out to lunch. Is everything okay, Jeff asked. I've noticed that you've been absent a lot lately, and I get the feeling that something is wrong. Yeah, you might say that, Roger said sarcastically. I'm fed up with that stupid church, and it's immature leadership. The Sunday school program stinks, and the pastor couldn't preach his way out of a paper bag. Most of the people here are unspiritual and unloving, and I'm just not getting fed anymore, and I'm thinking about leaving. Jeff was shocked. I can't believe what I'm hearing, he said. Just a few weeks ago, you were so excited about the church. You used to brag to everybody this was the greatest church in town. Just two months ago, you told me this was the most loving congregation you'd ever seen. What happened to change you? It's not me. It's the church that's changed, fumed Roger. Besides the incompetence of the Sunday school program, let me tell you a few other things I'm upset about. Jeff should have boogied right then. But for an hour, Jeff was amazed to hear Roger's complaints. For many weeks afterward, he met with Roger several more times, hoping to encourage him, but to no avail. Instead, he began to empathize with Roger's criticisms. Catch that? Because now we got secondhand, you heard of secondhand smoke? Now we got secondhand offense moving. Secondhand offense. Instead, he began to empathize with Roger's criticisms. It wasn't long until Jeff, too, began developing negative attitudes, and eventually he resigned from Sunday school. Bill Stedlin, person number three, a friend of Jeff's, took notice that both he and Roger were not as active in the church as they used to be. He observed that when they were in attendance, they usually sat together and would often whisper to each other during the services, always a bad sign. He realized something was wrong. So one evening, Bill saw the two at a local restaurant talking with others from the church. Everybody say, uh-oh, because now you've got dispersing. I've nursed it, I've rehearsed it, now I'm gonna get as many people that will come and I'm gonna disperse my offense. Well, Bill decided to join them. How's it going, guys, Bill said. Wasn't Sunday service great? 15 souls came to the Lord. What a sermon, praise the Lord. Everybody at the table just looked at each other. Sorry, we didn't notice, said Jeff smugly. I guess we were too preoccupied with the serious problems in the church. Problems? What problems? Bill chirped. Are you guys goofy or what? The church is doing terrific. Lives are being changed every Sunday. The church is growing. The congregation is ecstatic. What's your problem? Apparently, you're blinded to the reality of what's really going on, said Roger. The church is ruled by politics and unspiritual morons. Uh Uh-oh who don't care whose feelings they hurt. Besides, the people of this church have more faults than an earthquake zone. And furthermore, Bill interrupted. Whoa, wait a second. I've been wondering what's wrong with you guys, and now I guess I know. You're the ones who are blinded. You've developed a critical fault-finding spirit, and the devil has blinded you from being able to see the beauty of what the Lord is doing. Roger, Now, this is Bill talking to his friend Roger, the first one offended. Roger, I heard you got your feelings hurt when the pastor chose someone else over you for Sunday school superintendent. But instead of talking with him about it and forgiving him, you've developed a bitter, unforgiving spirit. Now the devil has deceived you into looking for fault in everything. And to make matters worse, you've taken your discontent and spread it to other brethren. This is a serious violation of God's word. You ought to know what the Bible says. It says God hates those who spread discord among the brethren. The word hate is very harsh language coming from God. And the Bible warns of calamity that will come upon those who spread discord. Now Bill's on a roll. He keeps going. 
Spreading discontent is disobedience to God and will not help solve problems, Roger. Gossip and bad-mouthing only makes the situation worse. Just a few weeks ago, Jeff thought everything was going great until you illuminated him. And how many others have you corrupted with your bad attitude? Bill continued. How did Jesus teach that we should resolve our differences with our brethren? You are to go to the persons you have offended or who have offended you and talk to them privately and resolve your dispute. Did you keep the matter private and go to the pastor? Did you go to others who offended you? No, you didn't. You selfishly chose to spread your complaints and opinions to others to gather their attention and sympathy to your own hurt feelings. I, I, I started thinking this had to be the preacher, but it's not. It's just a church member. He continues, we're almost to the close of his message to them. Roger and Jeff, where in the Bible does Jesus tell his followers to judge, criticize, or condemn our brethren? You can't tell me because it doesn't say it. However, Jesus did tell you to love and forgive your brethren, to submit, to prefer, to encourage, to dwell together in love and peace, not to badmouth one another, and on and on. Roger and Jeff were offended by Bill's lecture. Really? And thereafter, they avoided his fellowship. But months later, Roger became convicted about his own sinful attitude and realized that this was why the Lord had not been answering his prayers. Quote the Bible now, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Psalm 66, 18. Roger repented of his sin and asked the Lord to forgive him. A few days later, he went to the pastor and the other Christians he had bad mouthed and asked forgiveness. Roger recovered from his troubles and continues to serve the Lord to this day. Amen. But watch now. Sadly, the person whom Roger had influenced most, Jeff, became more critical and bitter. The discord had taken root and had severely damaged Jeff's faith. Unfortunately, discord is like a bad apple that'll spoil the whole barrel. An infection the devil uses to spread his evil disease. So watch what happened to Jeff. Jeff continued to spread the seeds of discord. Dozens left the church and the discontent spread, severely damaging the ministry, all beginning with one offense. Souls ceased coming to the altar for salvation, and the loss of tithers caused the church to struggle for several years. Jeff also had many heartaches and no longer serves God. Christians must never forget that their words can promote life or death, unity or division, love or hate. Although Roger was forgiven for his evil words sown, his mouth was an instrument of destruction to his friend Jeff and to many others. Satan used his mouth to nearly destroy a whole church. Everybody smile at me. See, this is the reality of why Jesus said, woe to the world because of offenses. The Bible clearly warns us, Christians, to mark those who cause division and strife and to avoid them. They are used by the devil to cause trouble to the church and to the work of the gospel. And the Bible warns even further that the sower of discord is going to face a calamity. The Bible says a worthless person, a wicked man, walks with a perverse mouth. He winks with his eyes. He shuffles with his feet. In other words, he sends signals stealth-like. Instead of just coming out and saying something, he's sending signals to other people that are, that are discord, that sow discord, that sow unhappiness, that sow um, unsettledness, that sow negative things. They know they can't come out and say it, so they wink with their eye and shuffle with their feet and make hand motions and send signals to others that, that they can get away with. And then he goes on, he devises evil continually, he sows discord. Therefore, his calamity Listen, everybody, shall come suddenly. Suddenly, he will be broken without a remedy. Everybody say, oh me. Powerful stuff, right? But see, in the church, folks, we don't understand the power of words and how we can, one person, just one guy, Roger, 
got offended. Roger got offended because they didn't appoint him to a Sunday school position. He got offended. And his offense was dispersed to Jeff. And then Jeff became poisoned by the coral snake of offense, secondhand offense. And then they got other church members together, and, and the offense bit them. And then Roger down the road repents, but Jeff never got over it. And Jeff was ruined, from what I get from this story, for life. And the church was almost destroyed because one man got offended and did not go to the source of the offense but dispersed it to people that weren't part of the problem or part of the solution. So the story, and the reason I've read it, is to show us why Jesus taught so strongly against the coral snake of offense. Our church is praying for revival. Amen? Revival. And so uh, for revival to come, it takes a lot of prayer, and it also takes getting our, our hearts clean. And, and you know what? God blesses unity in a house. God blesses unity in, a, in, a, in the house. The psalmist said that where there is unity, God will literally command a blessing. Now, I told you this was preemptive. Uh, th this is not because there's a bunch of offenses, but how many of you can say, I think I've heard this message today? Come on, everybody. I think I've heard this message today. Say, come on, Pastor Jeff, are you sure there's not things going on that you brought this? No, I'm telling you that I want, I, I'm bringing a preemptive word because I want us to be wise when we see a coral snake. We say, that's a coral snake. And we don't allow it to bite us in Jesus' name. I pray that if there's, amen, come on. <clears throat> I pray that if there's unresolved offenses amongst us in our homes, uh, in our marriages, in our businesses, with our kids, with our neighbors, or in church, that we will take it seriously and get it under the blood and, and, and go to the person where there's an offense and make it right. Because folks, I wanna be blessed. I want the greatest blessing I can possibly have. I don't want there to be anything between me and God. I wanna be totally and completely clear. So can we stand up today in Jesus' name? I want you to say with me, amen, I got the shot. Now say with me, it stung, but not near as bad as Jeff ended up stung. Amen? Give the Lord a hand of praise. Come on. Amen. I don't know where my player is, but let's lift our hands to the Lord, and let's just bless the Lord today in Jesus' name. Lord, we just thank you and we bless you. We praise you. Now, Lord, we come to you with this serious issue of offenses. We, we come to you with this, this thing of offenses and, and uh, the discord that results and, and the way you taught us to handle it and, and, Lord, how we need to forgive. And we just come to you. We come to you as a church body. We come to you, Lord, and we ask you for your help. We ask you, Lord, if there is an offense between us and our spouse, us and our children, Lord, if there's an offense between us and anyone in church, help us to handle it wisely, rightly, the way it should be, in the name of Jesus. Now, folks, lift your hands and, and, and just say, Lord, if, if there's an offense in my heart, I forgive. Come on, everybody. If there's an offense in my heart, I forgive. If I've been offended by anybody, Lord, I forgive them as you through Christ have forgiven me. Lord, I forgive, and I ask you, Lord, to grace me, to release them. And, and now pray with me and just say, Lord, if I need to go to them and deal with it, grace me to do it and to clear the air so that I can experience maximum blessing in the name of Jesus Christ. Now I want us just to wait before the Lord just for a moment and let the Spirit of God speak to you. If there be anything that needs to be settled between you and another, let the Spirit of God speak to you. You know, sometimes with our heads bowed, let me just talk to you for a minute, bow your head in prayer. There, there have been times where, where I said, Lord, is there anything I need to make right? And the Lord would put somebody on my heart and say, why don't you give them a call? 
and ask them if everything is good with you and them. And I've made calls. And sometimes there was nothing there, and other times there were things that needed to be worked out. But, you know, we live in, a, we live in an offended world. It seems like everybody is offended by something. And uh, it needs to be settled. You know, look at our world. Everybody's offended, and what do you see? You see hate. You see discord. You see violence. You see horrible, vile language aimed at one another. That all comes from unresolved offense. We believers are to be children of light and children of the day. So let the Spirit of God speak to you as we just worship for a moment. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I've got three sisters. I was the only boy, three sisters, firstborn, me. And my oldest sister, man, I got a call one night. And she was so mad at me. Now, she, at the time, wasn't walking with God. She created new words to call me. And I asked her what was wrong, and she gave this, this, this reason. But I said, you know, how many of you ever noticed some people, sometimes they give the stated reason, and then there's the real reason, right? So from that night on, she broke relationship with me, walked away. Are you ready? For years. For years. And I would try to say, what did I do? Well, she could never tell me exactly what I did. I never knew. I was walking with God, praying. I, I, I never knew what I did. But one Thanksgiving, the Lord spoke to me and said, Jeff, you're going to have to humble yourself and just go to her. Well, she was in Houston, and I was in Fort Worth. And yet, the impression was so strong, I got in my car, and I drove all the way to Houston, all the way to her house, and knocked on the front door. And she answered the front door and looked at me like, whoa, whoa, oh, what are you doing here? I said, I said, can I talk to you, just you and me, alone? And we went into a room, shut the door, and I said, I don't know what I did, but, but let's just say Jill. Jill, um, I don't want there to be this thing between us. So whatever I did, I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? Now, she wasn't a believer. And they don't know what to do when you say, would you forgive me? Non-believers, they don't know what to do with that. But she said, well, no, that's not necessary. So I said, no, it is necessary. I, I need you to say it. She said, well, no, I, I don't really need it. No, you really do need to say it. I'm asking you to say it. I forgive you. And she, fa 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 I fa 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 forgive you. And from that moment on, we were clear. But I had to be the one. I know this, if I hadn't done it, and this was like 15 years ago, if I hadn't done it, it'd still be broken today. Sometimes you just have to say, you know what? I'm going to take the low road. And I'm going to do my best to make this right. Folks, God loves unity. Amen. Can we give the Lord a hand of praise? He loves forgiveness. 